Musical Talk, the independent musical theatre podcast at the Edinburgh Fringe. Hello and welcome to Musical Talk. I'm Thos Ribbits, and not to be mistaken with my good friend Eddie Nabura Fringe who's a man who should probably give you some idea of what this episode's going to be about. Yes, it's that time again. It's the largest arts festival in the world. It's the Edinburgh Fringe 2012. What a year it is for culture and sport in this country. We have the Olympics, but we also have had the Cultural Olympiad, and now we have the Edinburgh Festival and the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. Now, what's going to happen over the next few weeks is actually slightly different to usual. What you're going to get today, ladies and gentlemen, is a pre preview program for Edinburgh this year. What you're going to hear are songs and interviews with the creatives behind three very different but very excellent musicals which you'll be able to see at this year's Fringe. But in the next two weeks we're going to have some completely non-Edinburgh programs. Next week we'll be hearing from the wonderful Keith Arrowsmith about London Road, the verbatim musical at the National Theatre. Keith has recently interviewed some of the creatives behind that for a fascinating conversation, and you can hear that next week. The week after that, our very own Nick Hudson is talking to Neil Patrick Harris, who's, of course, a big Broadway musical star currently in this country. So that's an interview that I'm sure everyone will want to hear. But then after that, it's the traditional series of programmes looking at and then looking back at The Edinburgh Fringe 2012. So today, if you like, is an overture. You'll get to hear something of what's going on up in Scotland, and then, in the next two weeks, what's back on in London, and then in a few weeks' time, we'll be starting our annual series of in-depth interviews with the people behind so many of the wonderful musical shows that you can see at the Edinburgh Fringe every year. It is really a hotbed of creativity and a hotbed of creativity in our sphere, musical theatre. Anyway, well, let's not drag this on any longer than we need to. We've got a lot of things to get through. So let's go straight to our first show, Bereavement the Musical. Now, stick in there with that title. It's all going to be explained and it may not be quite what you think it is. And I'm delighted to say that the people behind that show have said that we can play two songs. So to introduce this interview... Let's hear one of the songs from Bereavement the Musical. Musical Talk at the Edinburgh Free. It's a funny little cabaret we go through. The stage is open and the players are in full view. There's a part for you and you will have to play it. The script Because bereavement never brings the final curtain It was easy when we looked for a conclusion Make it easy, never shatter the illusion
crazy just to see what we have come to. There's a part for you and you will have to play it. It's bereavement and we've just got to obey it. Jeff Carpenter, I'm the composer for Bereavement the Musical. Hi, I'm Maureen O'Hagan and I co-wrote Bereavement the Musical. Now, people are first immediately going to say, Bereavement the Musical, and they'll probably use that inflection, I'd have thought, <laughs> um, because that's an unusual name for, well, any show, but certainly a musical. So, the obvious question is, why Bereavement the Musical? Right, well, I personally think that there are two bizarre things in life, uh, things that you can't explain. You look harder, there's many more than two. <laughs> well, the things that which absolutely bowl you over, one of, one of them is bereavement, and the other one is musical theatre. I think that they're, they're both zany, and I think that actually um, one of the main ways you can convey bereavement and the, the ridiculousness of, of it is through musical theatre. The, the tagline for the show is, bereavement is a song and a dance, watch people singing and dancing about it. So I think that, Maureen, do you want to go on a well, bit Jeff well? and I um, both lost parents in our teens, and it, it was interesting when we, we began to talk about that, because we were kind of recognising you know, similar experiences in one another and some things that we just hadn't experienced the same at all. But I think one thing we were struck by is that when you're suddenly kind of bereaved, there's a kind of bizarre spotlight put on you and that you're this bereaved person. And particularly when you're at school, I think, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, people are watching you, seeing how you're coping um, and you're kind of not really sure how you are meant to act, you know. Are you, are you sort of meant to just know what to do when you're bereaved? Mm-hmm. And I, I think that kind of, that that's funny spotlight on you worked well for this kind of slightly cabaret <coughs> That's style right, yeah, piece. yeah. I mean, that's very interesting, because uh, you first described it as zany, mm-hmm. but it seems to be, but just, just to explore that a little bit, you seem to be sort of saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, and in fact it's just that the strangeness of, modern, uh, of normal life stopping suddenly, mm. and then you're becoming a focus, and then there's all these forms which are essentially Victorian still. So you're quite right mm. in the sense that it, it's a very unnatural thing it's that unnatural. we do in response to a sadly horribly natural thing that has yeah. happened. People want to watch you to you know to kind of see how you're dealing with it, how you're acting under the circumstances, but don't really know how to talk to you. And and that may be yeah. more of a generational thing because you know no. when we were in our <laughs> teens you know very few people at school or you know in our social circles yeah. knew anything about that. So we kind of felt that we I suppose we felt like we actually had something to say, which yes. you might not at this age. And also that maybe, you know, other people might recognise some of the things that we've observed. We, we tried to get other people's experiences involved as well. Of course. Um, or, or that maybe, you know, just, just talking about some of the things that we thought maybe you didn't expect to to find coming with bereavement. You know, some, some of it's quite comic, really, in retrospect. Yes. Some of the re- reactions we've had or... With a cold, calm eye, I can see that, uh, yes, it just seems a very strange time. Yeah. So, I mean, forgive me, and I, what I don't want to do is intrude on your family circumstances. I'm not going to ask that question, but you, keep, you, do, you have mentioned several times being so young, uh, which, of mm. course, is an extra level of unusualness. Mm. Um, is it rude to ask whether these uh, bereavements were recent? I mean, you said you were teenagers, um, but you were both so beautifully young. <laughs> well, we're in our 20s you know, it, now. So, so you have got enough distance that this isn't going to hurt you either. Yeah, you know, absolutely. People are going to say, gosh, you know, this is... It feels a bit... Interesting adjective. It, it feels um, as if it could be a piss take, but in um, fact, there's a message, is it? Not? Or, not, or at least not, an exploration. I would like to say that it's not angsty and that it's not a piss take. Yeah. So yeah. it's. I, I I hope you know that it's kind of fairly reverent, but also kind of with a self-knowing laugh. Not yeah. A, I, I, but the best way to describe it really is: um, my mum died when I was 15, and I'm now 21. So, you know, there's been a lot of um, distance between it. There's no way that I would have 
you know, even considered really writing a diary about it because it at the time because it's just so um, upsetting and it really like blows you over. But when you look back on it, there are some there are some things which I did which I found you know I can laugh at, and there are, and there are other things which I do which I think people wouldn't necessarily know that that's what happens when you're bereaved and also especially talking to other people um, I mean a classic one is the fact that uh, a lot of people have the experience where they really want to laugh at the funeral but they just absolutely feel that they cannot do that um, that's you know a classic one I suppose just imagine that but sort of for ages um, there's quite a lot actually which people just do not know about um, bereavement so that's yeah that's been the inspiration yeah, for me lot of what are you meant to do you know am I mm-hmm. a, you know, are you allowed to go to the theatre, you know, when you're yeah. sort of grieving or whatever? What's expected of one? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. it does really yeah. feel, I think, like suddenly there's a lot of attention on yeah, you yeah, and, yeah. and maybe not, you know, a helpful attention. Um, it's also one of the few areas of society left, I think, in, you know, in the social society mm-hmm. that are very strictly trammelled, you're quite right, whereas mm-hmm. not quite anything goes, but, you know, morality is very much more relaxed and, and relative mm. um, in almost all spheres of modern life you know we don't live like our parents let alone our grandparents and yet I bet we are expected to do all the same things during a period of bereavement mm. and a funeral that we are that our parents and grandparents and great grandparents before then mm-hmm. will have sure. done so you're right so it's, it's, it's a, an immediate throwback to a way of reacting that people find that they, they, there are expectations and well, they're not new expectations that's right there are uh, but also I think I felt I don't uh, you know maybe we didn't explore this but if I kind of knew what the rules were of how I was meant to behave, you know, just in the kind of at least in the week after my father died, that could have been quite useful because you're suddenly, you know, what you don't sure. know what you're doing. Well, the, the fact is, um, no one knows anything about no. bereavement, and that's basically the, the moral of the, the show. <laughs> well, let us bring it onto the show. Forgive me, I, I did want to explore the sort of the, um, the, the, the feelings and the, the theory behind it because, yeah. you know, forgive me, with a title like that, you are inviting people Absolutely. to say, God, this is a little out of the ordinary. So you had this discussion, you thought, well, this is an area that's ripe for exploration and it probably hasn't been explored very thoroughly in musical theatre mm. before. Mm-hmm. When did you decide that it should be a musical? Well, last summer, it, all in Edinburgh, actually. Um, Very sensible place to start. We were talking about these experiences and it being a musical yeah. right from the start. Absolutely. Um, I Basically, I, I uh, wrote a couple of songs which were about bereavement, and then I knew my experiences, and I thought, well, yeah, could this work as a musical? And um, so that's, that, that's when me and Maureen started talking about it. And I think the focus was always the theme. You know, we didn't want a kind of a plot driven narrative yeah. where some really angsty death scene happens and people <laughs> cry a little you know we wanted to kind of start with kind of bereavement as the theme this is why it's kind of yeah. so simply named and you know kind of have that as a centre and have different ways into it you almost you said cabaret earlier as well which is sort of I'd, yeah I'd say it's, it's, a, it's a cabaret style or cabaret influenced musical review following six characters specifically through that, who are all very, very different, different ages, different um, personalities, different circumstances of uh, bereavement, and their own journey through it. And they interla- interlink and interact? A little bit, a little right. bit, not too much, because we thought it would maybe be a bit too cheesy if they all got paired up at the end, but there is a little oh. bit. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, yes. That's good. I, I do try to have re- reactions with pe- interactions with people that don't necessarily revolve me getting married. <laughs> um, in fact, most of them, in fairness, as my milkman will be very pleased, I should imagine. Um, so, right, you've established that it was going to be a musical. Um, did you both know that each other could... that you could both write songs? I... Mm. Well, I've, I've, <laughs> I've <laughs> that, that, that noise needs exploring. I'm not sure I want to confess it. I did write a musical myself, um, you know, ages ago, before my father died, um, which I also wrote music for, and I think it should be forgotten. But you both had <laughs> some experience of writing songs. Yeah, I, I've I've um, been writing songs uh, since I was quite young, and um, so I, I love music, and so that's my main sort of thing. Um, but Jeff is the musical brain. I I'd written. Um, kind of comedy um, before, but but not really songs. So that was a that was a new new thing. But I quite like it. There's no way I would have written it by myself. And the fact that um, Ma- Maureen and I, um, you know, both had similar experiences. And also, I think it helps that I'm a boy, Maureen's a girl. So I think that helps as well. Um, yeah, so well, human yeah. life is there, frankly, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> 
So you've got together, you've decided you're all going to put on this musical, you've got a sort of rough idea that it's going to be a number of characters. How did you sort of sketch out those characters and then put flesh on the bone? And um, how did it, you know, when did you know that you actually had a viable piece, but it had legs? Um, it was all very. I mean, we thought it would be a good fringe piece. Um, yes. Obviously, we, you know, I wouldn't go straight to the West End with this. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my mum's hoping that it will go to Broadway, but um, <laughs> she doesn't very. It might go she to really know much. <laughs> exactly, she doesn't know very much about musical theatre, and uh, it's probably not the right style. But we thought, you know, kind of an hour-long fringe piece would be great. And then, sort of last year, Jeff suddenly said to me, "Oh, there's a deadline coming. We could get some funding to do previews in Cambridge." And it was really last minute, mm-hmm. and I almost hope we didn't get it because we hadn't thought about it. Mm-hmm. But suddenly we had funding suddenly we had a slot and it all just kind of snowballed and then yeah. and, and that's a great thing about Cambridge is you know you have to you have to try and apply for things because you might not get them but then if you do then you're stuck and you suddenly have to write a show um, <laughs> yes once the infrastructure is in place you would look foolish if you didn't come up with the cherry yeah, on the top because, of your bakewell yes. because it's advertised and you just have to go for it and so that was probably quite useful for us yeah definitely definitely I think by the time it came to that, we we had already, we knew it was going to be six people. We knew what these songs were going to be about. We knew all of the themes that we wanted to cover, all of, um, you know, all of that. So that was all in place. Actual songs, we probably still only had the two that I'd written. Um, but we, we all, so many of the ideas were there and, and ready to go. We just wanted an excuse to do it. And it's going to be, I, I think it's an ideal place to do it at the Edinburgh Fringe. I, yeah. I can't wait. And it was something... Yeah, I guess because it it was something that we felt was maybe a bit risky because yes, it does sound kind of irreverent as a title and you know, I think we had to be quite brave to go, yeah, we actually kind of feel something for what we're writing. Um, It was was probably quite good to um, to kind of be pushed out of our comfort zone and to just have to do it and that, you know, other people sort of had faith in us when we applied and um, yeah, otherwise, you know, we might not have had the guts to do it. So, if I would, can you describe the tone of the piece in one word, or would you say that actually it varies? Because I noticed you said it, it varies. Oh. Yeah, bittersweet. That's is, the yeah. hyphenated word. <laughs> I'll accept melancholy. That's fine. Um, um, <laughs> well, in... but it's not. So it's bittersweet. That's fine. It's bittersweet yeah. because because it's 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 me and Maureen looking back at our experiences and sharing experiences with others and looking at because the reason that you go through these things is, is always sad mm. but some of the things which you do are funny so what mm. ends up being the thing which most people have said to us is that it's it's very honest and that a lot of people a lot of theatre nowadays or you know isn't isn't always honest it's it's more about sort of um being commercial somehow and, and being glib and giving you a lot of received wisdom rather than actually maybe. allowing you to find it yourself that's right I, and I would agree with that entirely. I, th- I think the whole point with this is that the received wisdom, if you like, about bereavement doesn't really exist. So this is actually, you know, our experiences in song and dance. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's quite honest. I guess it was, it was a first for us, you know, to be writing something that I, I guess we felt from ourselves rather than, you know, oh, what kind of play could we write? Or, you know, sure. we weren't putting something on for the sake of it. Um, and I, I think we thought originally that it would be mostly comic, and then inevitably, I think it ended up being a bit more poignant than we had intended because you can't kind of escape its origins. But also, then equally, yeah. there were bits that were quite... The, the audiences and the previews laughed at, which we hadn't intended to be funny at all. And maybe our, sure. maybe we were sometimes blunter than people expect because actually, mm. you know, to say someone's, you know, my dad's dead is like, it's normal for us. And for other people, that's sure. quite a blunt way of saying yes. it. So... It's, it's not your conversational opening gambit of many occasions, no. is it? Yes. No. Down past no. the sort. Yes. But it's, it's that awkward moment. I guess, you know, when, when someone says, oh, what does your father do? And you go, well, he's dead. You know, you kind of kill a conversation with that. Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> There's not a lot of way around it. So <laughs> yeah. now we're going to sing about it instead and make it really awkward. Well, here's a question then, because I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of the tone as well, because you said there are six characters and they've each got a sort of theme that, they're, that they're, their story presumably represents. But you also said... There was a range of feelings. There's a poignancy. Mm. There's a certain amount of comedy. That you know, the, 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 the melancholia, the, the bittersweet nature of it all. Did you look at them, these six themes, on a piece of paper, and you know, how, when did you know to be counterintuitive with the comedy, and when did you know to be true to the? Mm. I'm, I'm not sure I would even be able to say what the themes were. Um, They're situations, you say themes, yeah, but which are usually exaggerated versions with exaggerated outcomes of things that Maureen and I 
uh, experienced what other people we know experienced. Yeah, we did talk to other people. It's not just it's not just an autobiography. No, no, no. <laughs> um, but um, well, it's six people, so <laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> that don't, would be difficult. I think it it, it differed for me um, from writing comedy because there you're kind of constantly asking, "Is that funny? Is that funny?" This we didn't do at all. I mean, we never had to ask is it funny and uh, I've kind of done rewrites because we're sort of you know changing a bit to take it to Edinburgh um, and I thought oh maybe I should make this funnier but but nothing but, but then I just left that because everything that's funny has just kind of you know happened that way for me and for Maureen we'd rather forsake a bit of comedy in order to make it truthful really yes. in order to make it actually accurate about yeah. how we feel and you said honest which I think is such an interesting word in this context it's what people have said when we previewed it at, at and, Cambridge and I guess it is because again we, we I mean for a long time we didn't know how it would turn out on, st- on stage we didn't no. have a format we didn't we couldn't you know visualise it at all it was something it didn't have a model so I guess we just had to be honest you know and say what we thought and, it, and it, I mean it's funny it, it kind of do we want to talk about reviews? It got um, it got some great reviews, and it this got is in previews. Yeah, yeah. Um, and one that wasn't so great. But it mm-hmm. then got a huge audience response in Cambridge, which really surprised me because I do like to sort of try and keep my head down a bit more. It is strange because when we previewed it, it started selling out, and it was getting standing ovations. Um, so you know, which we. Yes. To be honest, never We're really very expected. Surprised. We just thought it would be a bit embarrassing that we'd expose ourselves and that really. would be how we'd go home. <laughs> but people, I think, I think, well, if, if people loved it, it was probably because they, they loved the fact that we had been honest and we yeah. had told them about something maybe oh, they didn't know yeah. about. That's what I was going to. Some people, yeah. I think, felt it kind of sort of resonated and felt it to be quite truthful. Yeah. And, you know, some people said that they thought it wasn't truthful at all, and we kind oh, of really? thought, well, you know, fine. Maybe not for you, yeah. but I guess I guess we were just, you know, saying what happened for yeah. us. So that is as truthful as you can get. I mean, it's intentions <coughs> are truthful. So this is your first time in collaboration, certainly with each other. Yeah, that's how, right. How does songwriting work for you two then, as a writing partnership? Um, well, most of the ideas came from us just um, sitting around for a couple of days at Jeff's College. Um, talking about ideas so we'd got ideas pretty fully formed and we got phrases that we'd written together mm-hmm. and some of the things you know I remember saying something quite shocking and you going yeah write that down and yeah, yeah, you yeah. know so we we kind of generated the ideas together and then sort of went separate ways over the holidays and so you wrote the song separately did you oh but you wrote the music so yeah but the lyrics were a joint effort here and there or yeah that's that's right well the, the lyrics were absolutely we were coming up with them like it's, like Maureen was saying, to, together from the very beginning, and then from that point on, we sort of decided to split up the work and and take it, and then we would do rewrites together. So, oh. so that was. So you went away and Jeff, came back, and went away and came back in different combinations. Well, we That's had right. the holidays, yes. and so Jeff would kind of send me lyrics that I'd edit and vice versa. Yeah, and then um, and then uh, same with dialogue. We felt we needed some dialogue, and then obviously I had to write the music by myself. So and it worked quite well in that. Um, I don't really like kind of starting from nothing and having a blank page, but Jeff's quite good at going, I'm going to put these words down, and then I go, ah, no, change this, change this, change it. And that worked quite well because I yeah. quite like editing, Jeff doesn't. I hate it. Yeah, and I don't like starting from scratch. Oh, right. So, um, <laughs> I, it gets me scared. So that's an originator and a dramaturg. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe, well, that yeah. Sounds, that sounds like a, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> in terms of I the like dra- talking about it first, and, yeah. then, and then you've got something to go from. I do want to say as well, as well as the... Um, on the lines of dramaturg, we got um, our, our great friend Andy to direct it, and um, Andy and I did this. Do you want to give us a surname? Oh, Andy sorry, Brock. Andy Brock. Lovely. Or Andrew Brock, I should say. Um, <laughs> Andrew David <Sure>. Brock. Lord <laughs> Brock. <yes. laughs> he, um, Andrew and Brock did not want to be involved at first because he, he wanted didn't. us to write something serious about bereavement and our experiences, and he hated the title, but he's come round. He's, he's come round to it. Um, <laughs> he wasn't yeah. prepared to die in a ditch over it, I see. <laughs> yeah, but he's. You know, no, no, he's, he's been really useful. Yeah. Yeah, and somehow really um, managed to persuade him. He he, uh, the way I'd say it maybe is I sort of directed the songs, but um, Andy like directed the show, and it was so your musical director. In the sense, yes, yeah. yes, and then um, and I'm also playing the piano for the for the run in in Edinburgh, um, and which is something to watch. I, I, <laughs> watching you know Jeff on the stage the whole show, it's it's really incredible. Um, but about Andy, um, <laughs> the and he's. Um, 
you know, we, we would sort of give him this, uh, if you like, list of songs, maybe a bit of dialogue, and he would know how to structure it, how to direct it, um, how to get across the cabaret field, but without sort of ramming it down people's throats. Yeah. Um, he's just been such a force in terms of, I would say, even in the writing process, because it's about getting the words and the songs to resonate properly the way the way that they should do when they come off the page um, so he's just been absolutely great throughout the whole creative process as well how would you describe your music I mean <coughs> once again once again one, one doesn't want to sort of uh, pigeonhole people but you know are you rocky are you folky are you musical theatre history heritage <laughs> <laughs> what are you well this... I did jazz ha- a jazz hand, <laughs> jazz just, hand. just the one jazz hand so <laughs> I don't want to get too exhausted <laughs> well um this, <laughs> this, this musically, I'd say this is, um, it's like all bits of musical theatre from all over the place, from the kind of the exactly. 30s, but definitely from musical theatre. Like, it's almost a parody of musical theatre styles in some places. There's sort of Kandra and Ebb, um, Schwartz, uh, you know, some epic stuff, like just, just mad, just all, some opera. You said some 30s, who's your 30s? Um, <laughs> Oh, it's homage. Oh, it's, it's, well, I'm just trying to think of that whole. I mean, this would be 50s, but Irving Berlin, you know, like the, the whole kind of that whole sort of golden age musical sound of American, um, and it's all just been um, rammed into the thing. These, it's, <laughs> it's 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 solo piano. We've got a live, yes. um, we've got a real piano on stage, which is I'm obsessed with, and um, it's just piano and the singing. And I guess that kind of that mix. Um, can be linked to this idea that you're kind of just thrown into this spotlight and you're suddenly kind of meant to know how to act and, sure. and you sort of kind of snatch at these styles and see how how you know what you that's can do why it's got quite a pastiche feel because because almost when the people are put into these situations that they don't understand or they feel that they're being expected to act in a certain way it makes sense that it would be a sort of pastiche and, and you know kind of I guess grief is portrayed all over the stage you know and and actually bereavement is a kind of long straggly process oh, that yeah. goes on for ages and, and it doesn't actually has finish ups and downs <laughs> and yeah yeah we were just saying a moment yeah. ago that i guess you know it maybe took kind of three years i think to just feel ready to talk about things properly yeah. um but i mean you're never kind of going to go okay i'm fine about that now i don't you know miss them or whatever and people might expect you to sort of go through a year process which you can uh pinpoint off, you yes. can't <laughs> not like giving up cigarettes or something like that actually maybe it is similar I don't smoke but maybe it is in the sense that I don't know if anyone can ever say I've quit cigarettes I've stopped smoking I don't know if you can say I've quit you know so maybe it's similar it's like a radioactive half-life it never quite goes away maybe yeah 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 yeah. Interesting idea for a musical. And it flares <laughs> up at, yeah, at funny of course. times. Yeah, of course. Also, yeah. it is like addiction in a strange way then, but, mm. you know, forgive me, it comes back when you least expect it, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I mean, we, we were asked if um, if it was a cathartic process for us, and at the right, time, yeah, I, don't writing think, it. I don't think we did. Um, but maybe looking back, you know, maybe it has... When people were asking us at the time, you know, is this is this like your way of therapy? Maybe it is because when I when I look back at it now, um, you know, it's almost like I'm hearing the words for the first time some of the, some yeah. of the time. It's bizarre, actually. I, I don't think it felt like <laughs> yeah. therapy, kind of the, the process of going through it, but it does feel kind of it. It feels good to kind of have used something bad in a way that could you know maybe be communicating with other people I don't want to suggest that it will necessarily but you know at least we're we're kind of trying it sounds like it's honest to you as the creators as well as to the audience well we wouldn't be happy about doing anything that was not yeah would we so yeah when it it touches something kind of quite personal you wouldn't want to be hackneyed about it but I think I think the moment that did kind of move me was the opening night and you know I used to talk to my dad about going into theatre and he was quite encouraging and he's got no idea what I'm doing now but I remember sort of thinking at the opening night he'd be really pleased, he'd be thrilled to see that I'm doing this, he'd be, he'd be thrilled probably that we're doing something that we yeah. kind of meant and you know it's not a tribute or anything like that no, but he but probably you know wouldn't mind having a small part in the in the process <laughs> um well in some ways i mean forgive me without being crude or vulgar yeah, but that is exactly yeah yeah you, yeah. you, you could you wouldn't have written it without the circumstances yeah. is it rude to ask how your other parents have found it when you told them you were doing it you said your um, mother wants to go to broadway which uh, which i take to be a thumbs up yeah um i think she's suddenly yeah would you care to invest 
<laughs> no. <laughs> my, my dad's um, been very supportive and um, uh, has also helped me through the writing process. Uh, uh, Fantastic. Now let's talk about. Uh, my, oh. uh, one thing my mother said. My, my parents were divorced already, so uh, extra complication. But my mum came to see it, and she's a GP. And she, and um, you know, there were moments where I was kind of sinking down in my seat, sitting next to her, thinking, I, I can't believe my mum's watching this. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> um, and my mum came out, and you know, some bits are slightly rude, whatever. Um, um, Ray Hutchins. Uh, yeah. And I thought, oh, what's she going to say? And she said, Maureen. This is her GP kind of voice. I think that's the kind of thing a lot of my patients would like to have seen. <laughs> she, oh, so right. she, th- she thought it had a kind of medical value. Um, oh, right. So, oh, also... Um, that was interesting. Also, um, there's the Theological College um, <laughs> in Cambridge. Loads of those folks came to see it, and they loved it. Um, really? I, yeah, oh, really? they loved it. And Because uh, I, I study theology, um, and there's a there's a little bit of religion in it. Not it's by no means evangelical. It's just yeah. exploring religious but, and issues. And so often wrapped up into the process. Exactly. Yeah. And often, you know, people kind of really push against religion or kind of turn to it in bereavement. So those kind of different responses. Were... So if you're a priest or a doctor, come and watch it. Yeah. I, was, I was interested to say that presumably a doctor wouldn't expect a sequel, but perhaps uh, your friends who are off to be doctors of divinity might. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it can be very helpful, I think, for um, for doctors also to know about grief, which is why maybe your your mum... Mm, my mum said that... I don't, I don't want to spoil some of yeah. the, the secrets, but, you know, that people have asked about similar things and... Mm-hmm. Um, Let's talk about Edinburgh itself then. So where are you booked and how can people see you? This is always an important thing to say. We are in sea venues and it's at 6.40, which is a nice this evening. This is the, the big sea venue in Chamber Street. Mm-hmm. That's right, yeah. We've yeah. been given a really big audience, um, you know, bigger than we were kind of... Audience or auditorium? <laughs> the audience have yet to auditorium. prove themselves, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> We've been given uh, lots yeah. of seats, which we kind of weren't expecting, so no. we would very much like to film them because, of, you know... Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. yeah. Sea is one silence. of the musical silos, isn't it? So it's, it's, it's one, of the place to, one of the places to go to see musical theatre. Absolutely. Mm. And it's I, a good I hover time. around there quite a lot. It's a good time. It's a good time. You Remind won't us the time again? 6.14. 6 and you can go out afterwards. Uh, and obviously, if you, want, if you want to book tickets, it's on the Ed Fringe website and also bereavementthemusical.co.uk. Mm-hmm. And, and you can listen to a... And walk-up at sea venues. Sorry? You can also do walk-up at sea venues. Yes, you, you certainly can. On the, you know, on the ground floor. Buy it, buy it, on, the, buy it on the day. And, and there's something on Twitter. I don't know how Twitter works, but clever oh, people are we're, searching we're at, I think we're just at bereavement. 2012, I believe. Yeah. But it's all our Twitter feeds on the website bereavementthemusical.co.uk. Mm. Let's say that again for posterity. Bereavementthemusical.co.uk. Just making sure that people can <laughs> write that down. That's very it's quite easy because it's a musical and it's about bereavement. The title is yeah. is <laughs> does, simple. Does what it says on the tin, in fact. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so people can proceed at the sea venues all the way through the fringe, which is a, an amazing run and difficult on your fingers. But before we sort of finish on this, then what are the for you personally? If you like, what's, what's the thing that you'll take from the creation of this musical? One each, you may confirm. Or phone a friend? I'm really glad. I, I've done lots of, you know, theatre. I've, I've sort of organised things, acted, written, and, you know, you spend all your time pushing theatre on people. <laughs> um, and I'm really glad that I've done something which I did for a real reason, um, not, you know, not just for another show. And... Um, that I kind of think the point of most things is to communicate with other human beings and I'm glad that I've done something that I feel like you know that I, I can try and do that with um, does that with truth yeah from truth yes well yeah it's definitely from a true feeling my, myself and with death and yeah I hope that kind of resonates sure yeah um, well for me uh, well it's <laughs> it's um it's it's pushed me in some in some new ways because I think it's it's uh, it's still I've I've done some other songs which are a bit more you know sort of silly, <laughs> which, which 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 includes this. But this has also had an extra element. So so directing this and um, and writing the songs was 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 pushing for me, which was which was great. And I'm I'm proud of myself that I could have uh, could have done that. Um, I'm also I was just delighted by the fact that people seem to love it so much um so for me that means that well what i set out to do is i just felt that bereavement and musical theater would go together and would 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 tell people something that and give them an entertaining show and it seems to have done that 
So I'm very proud of that as well. And I'm just very excited about seeing the, the Fringe. The preview audiences were interesting because, you know, normally if you come out of a production you've been in or, or whatever, no one's probably no one's going to say to your face that was rubbish you know most people say sure. you know well done you were great yeah. whatever but and then but, say it to everyone else <laughs> yeah but people in the previews were coming out and saying that really moved me for this reason not everyone felt that but those you know those people i'm really glad that if you know if anyone's got something remotely similar that it, it, it might appeal you're to making them. a real connection to real people I, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. That's no, that's pretty if, impressive. If you know, if, if if a few people find it soothing or whatever, or yeah. entertaining or, or lifts their spirits, then that's really nice. It is. It's it's a it's a wacky show. I think it's potentially the the, the wackiest thing I've ever done, and Andy's what? ever done. <laughs> it's more. <laughs> it's probably even more wacky than the show we did last year. So yeah, um, that I'm very proud of that too. Well, there you have it. Bereavement, the musical, is wacky and zany. (laughs) But truthful and honest. (laughs) Plus, bittersweet. (laughs) Yeah. Come and see it. (laughs) (laughs) And bring a tick sheet and say, oh, I've done that one. I've done that one. Oh, now I've done that one. Thank you very much. It's been delightful to hear from you. I shall see it in Edinburgh. And uh, perhaps I shall speak to you or your colleagues again. I'll let you know how truthful I find it. (laughs) Thank Thank you you very very much. much. Thank you. Musical talk. What are you thinking about her now? Well, this is what I've been trying to Can tell you. Can I get you. you anything? No, it's fine. Glass of wine? No, it's fine. I just want to give you a hug. Honestly, there's no need. You don't oh. need to. It's fine. <laughs> She's not always on my mind. I don't always hold her memory. She's not always running through me. Always in my thoughts She's not always standing by I don't always see her face I don't always have her picture She's not always on my mind Luckily, unluckily Life goes on And life is life, stuff happens You can't stay too long in sorrow Without her, there's still tomorrow When I think of her, when I do Yes, I'm blue I do want to But She's not always by my side It's not always where I want to be I might not remember clearly Or remember I don't always need her there Like before, I need her sometimes Though there's no more time together She's a part of me forever Even now it's different weather She's not always on my mind And I think she'd think That's fine I hope you enjoyed that interview about Bereavement the Musical and indeed the two songs, before and afterwards. It's always lovely to hear songs from the scores of these new musicals. And if you go to www.bereavementthemusical.co.uk you can see a lot more about that show. And of course, it's also on the Edinburgh Fringe website, known as Ed Fringe. But that's not the only musical we're going to be discussing today, because I also had the pleasure of meeting with Tom Gyron Towers, and forgive me if I've mispronounced that, and Grant Martin, the people behind Newland the Musical, also on at the Fringe. Let's hear a bit about that show. Musical Talk. Well, my name's Grant. I'm the musical director and the composer of Newland. 
Um, my name's Tom, and I'm the writer and director of the show. Now, Newland, yeah, or is it Newland the musical? No. <laughs> See, we, 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 for Edinburgh, we've called it Newland the Musical. It's officially called Newland, but um, I think we just wanted to make it clear to everyone it's Newland the Musical. Branded. Branded yeah. as a musical. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's so much happening up there. I think it's just very easy to quickly identify that we are a musical. Yeah. And you've not put an exclamation mark on, which uh, I applaud you for. A what? The musical? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Didn't think and, it needed it. Understated. <laughs> that's, that's the way forward. Slip it in and let them notice it <laughs> for its quality. Now, I'm going to ask you in a minute about sort of how it came about and the process, but actually, can you give us a, a briefly between you, and it'd be interesting to see if you can describe it, a thumbnail sketch of what Newland is. Uh, nice sound. Do you want to take this one? Uh, um, it's, it's, it's based during the California Gold Rush in the late 1800s, and uh, it's about a town that's doing incredibly well called Ashfall, it's, it's thriving, it's got this great sheriff, and then there's trouble and backstabbing, and yeah. he's betrayed by his, uh, his deputy who teams up with local uh, villains to become top dog and rid the lawman who is revered, and he is forced on the run and whilst on the run he stumbles upon the town of Newland, yeah. which is founded by a couple of comical brothers and um, basically they say to him we will offer you a place to lay low if you can give us some wisdom and help us promote our town. Yeah. And so a relationship develops there and, they, and the town thrives. And then we have a love triangle that's thrown in, in the mix on top of that. Yeah, yeah. And, and then he has to make a decision you about... there's a horse, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, he, and then he makes a decision on whether he's, you know, to, to go back and, you know, seek revenge or... Does he stay in... Yeah, does he stay in... Love and find a new okay. life. Yeah. So... Um, the way you're describing it, I'm guessing the tone is serious and not a comedy. It's or is a dramatic it, no. comedy. Oh, dramatic comedy. <laughs> the, the, the thing is, the, yeah, I think it's... Hedging your bets. <laughs> Sorry, forgive me. No, then there's a lot, there's, there is a lot of comedy in it. I think no, that's... I think when, when we first started... Um, when we first started putting on the show, we, we kind of... We didn't want it to seem like it was paint your wagon. No, yeah. it's like, not. As soon as anybody says a, a Western musical, it's yee-haw, thigh-slapping, Oklahoma, paint your wagon. Over the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and we, we didn't want to paint Newland as that. So originally when we did the first, I mean, the first poster, was it was black and white, and it was, we said, it's Very a bit like Deadwoods, you know, and and that really got the wrong vibe, I think, completely, <laughs> yeah. because it's it's not, it's totally. not that, and people were, you know, shouting expletives, like, oh, is that what it's about, like that? Yeah. And, you know, saying, can't want to say the word. But, um... And then, and then we kind of lightened it up, yep. like the poster and everything and how we presented it, because we realised it's not what people were expecting from the poster. We just we went so much in the ro- not the wrong... Well, it was the wrong direction, but the yeah, other really. direction of how we were trying to sell the show. And it should have... I think we were so worried about people going, oh, it's going to be yee-haw and all that kind of... And it, it's not that at all. So it has a serious heart, presumably. Yes, I think, yes. The, rela- the relationships yeah. are true. Yes. Yeah, 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 the yeah. story, the characters, is all very very quite serious and it, the comedy then stems from that and I think that's what good comedy comes from it's true characters and a true story so do I as it happens which it, so basically it's real life and real life of course is amusing and quirky and funny as well yeah. as difficult and uh, yes. yeah. Yeah, I and think unnecessarily so. yes. complicated on some cases <laughs> That's fine. So, right, OK, next question then. I'm going to ask you, and it, forgive me, it follows very closely on from that last one. One each. One adjective, please, to describe the tone as far as you see it. One adjective. Just so we can pitch it. It is fun. That's energetic. Oh, that's, that's a good one. It's fast. Energetic fun. It's fun and energetic. Fast paced. Yeah. yeah. It moves along at a speed. And I think, you know, your, the audience are dragged along and... You know, More so for Edinburgh. Up. Seriously, it gets it's a two, two and a half hour show that's condensed into an hour and a half slot. So, yeah. really a punching through the story. Yeah. So, well, let us move on from that. I may come and revisit that yeah, question I'm gonna, I'm again a little keep, bit later. I'm yeah, so that yeah. Way. Keep the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the back cog whirring on that one. Yeah. How did Newland come about? Um, we've been uh, writing songs together for quite a while, just just write, writing time. music. And, and we, we originally, when we first started writing together, we were going to write some musical. This is like when we were 12 years old. Um, start when you can. Yeah, also. yeah. And... and uh, we were going to write some musical. Well, we um, both come from a background in in drama. In drama, yeah. Oh, right, okay. Not necessarily musical drama then, but uh, well, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah it kind of was. Yeah, okay. yeah. kind of the youth, the youth kind of. Oh, right. So yeah. being in it school, yourself, not yes. just that you know your yeah. parents or family were. Yeah, no, no. We oh, were no, in no, it. No, we did yeah. all the classes. I did yeah, did loads of like amateur shows and stuff when we were younger and belonged to like a a youth agency and stuff like that. And is that how you met? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Through that. Um, 
So we started writing uh, this other musical and then we just we went <laughs> we, we were, no names no pack girl jolly good uh, no I'd rather not oh, yeah, we no, might we might revisit yeah. that but just not yet and then and then we started just writing music because we realised actually we could both take a piano and sing somewhere and that would be quite easy of getting our mm. stuff out there but it's putting on a musical especially when you're 12, 13 yes. it's never going to happen no one's going to take so it seriously so you took the cabaret route almost to begin with by which I mean no, actual proper I, cabaret, not. No, I'm, well, I'm, we turned. We did end up kind of doing pop writing, and that and we did. Yeah, yeah, lots of pop, pop mainstream, ballads, mostly kind of we commercial were, yeah. music. Right, okay. And we did that for a good few years, and we kind of progressed. We did some publishing houses, and we varying degrees of success with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, until it turned, we thought, well, it was about what eighteen, I suppose, at that point. I was studying music. You yeah, was, um, working, and you just, just working. Yeah, you need <laughs> script writing. And we thought we'd, we'd combine it and work on the show. I so, think, go on. I was just going to say, I was going to say, I think the story, I think when we were together, I think the story, I think I came up with a rough idea yeah. of, of this lawman, he gets betrayed early on and he has to go to this new town and he meets loads of different people. I think that was the, the essential, that was what was going to happen. Mm. Um, and then we started just writing music writing. to it. And, and, and rewriting. Yeah, and rewriting. And rewriting. And rewriting. How long ago was this then? I think seven <laughs> years. It must have been seven or eight years ago yeah. now, yeah. at least. Yeah, I think so. But it was always the kind of thing that was on the, the back burn. Mm. We kind of would just for, revisit for about, it. Yeah, for yeah. about four or five years it was always on the back burner. And then about three years ago, I suppose, I went away for mm. a while. I did work on um, cruise ships for oh, seven yes, years. Okay. And that gives you a, a lot of time, free time. <laughs> and so we said, look, we've got this show. Let, if we're going to do it, let's do it seriously. So I've got time here. I will crack on with music. Yeah, I'll finalise the, the script. And then the last three years, we've just blitzed it, really. And <laughs> Blitzed it. Three years, we blitzed yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a slow blitz. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. In fairness, though, you know, the Second World War lasted longer. So, yeah. Um, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so, obviously, so basically, you decided that now was the time to grapple with it, or they, and, and over time, it's come to be. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, how the most stages move if you don't mind me saying so you said that you almost worked in parallel in the sense that you were writing some of the songs Mm -hmm. whilst working on the cruise ship whilst you were sort of developing and fleshing out the plot how does one stay in contact if there's um, the the, 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 the shiny blue sea in the way when when, 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 um, Grant went on the cruise ships um, he had um we, he had the bulk of the script. I think yeah. the ending was in play. There was bits and pieces, yeah. but we knew where it was going. We knew each scene and, and Fairly everything. Fleshed out. Yeah, I mean, and to be honest, as well, at this point, the script was was twice as long. Not as the Edinburgh. Well, it was. Oh yeah, it was the, twice as long as the Edinburgh, of course. But it was even longer than the one we show, had. Yeah, it was. It was, <laughs> it was huge, and that was without all of the music. Um, so Grant kind of knew. We knew like what had to be written and where and when. So when Grant went over. And you only went away like at one point it was for like a couple like nine months yeah, and then nine came back. And six months. So we'd get back in contact with meet months. at Starbucks, like you know, typical writers with my Max out and blah blah blah. And then we kinda of did Once that. Again, you need to be careful how you say these things. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I I know I know exactly what that looks like, but that's kind of what we did and we'd meet up and then Grant would go off again and then, you know, we'd eventually So it's fairly something. punctuated your development process between the two of you, just because of circumstances. But, yeah, but did you felt progress was coming along or did you get yourself yeah. in the last in wrong directions and actually say can we pedal back from that and move off in this direction? No, to be honest, no, I don't yeah. think we ever really do that. We kind of we work together for so long. We kind of you know, synergy, end yeah. up yeah. always synergy. going yeah. in the right direction, or we know what we want. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, there were, you did. There were times when he would board, you know, get on, uh, get on the internet and stuff like that, and we'd be able to go, oh, look, I've done this so far, and this is going to change. What do you think of this? And it was like, yep, that sounds really good, or you know, yeah. and send the script back and forth and everything. Which, of course, of course, one can do these days. Which yeah, is I was going to say, it a little easier. Yeah. I was going to say, internet yes. is wonderful. It is, and the Royal <laughs> Mail at the time was, would have been considerably slower. <laughs> yeah. Right, so uh, you, you, it obviously came to be, and you say that the the full version, if you were doing this outside of the Edinburgh environment, would be about two and a half hours. So yes. it's a full two act yeah. yes. musical show. Yeah. Yes. which is the one thing that makes it quite difficult at the moment yeah. to really to Boil pitch it down, and yeah. well to pitch it and sell to companies. Because so many few people are now taking risks on new music and, it's, it's and new writing, big as well. It's but we're uh, hoping that's our selling point, really, because such new mm. writing is short, two, three, four, five handers, mm. small set, small scale. This is slightly leaning on the, the big spectacle type show in well, theory. I'm, I'm pleased because it's nice. It's, just, it's all very well having small shows, and there'll always be small mm. shows. And there's a lot of there's a mm. place for good small shows. Oh, but, definitely. But occasionally, it's very difficult to be truly evocative mm. of you know the siege of Mafeking with four people or mm. whatever. Yeah, it is. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we we Does tried to go as a challenge for a writer. I tell yes. you. Yeah, <laughs> and for the director. Yeah. I thought, yeah. <laughs> no, we tried to go traditional West Ends big. Yeah. Which is very hard for two guys who have never really yeah. put on a musical before. 
how would you describe your writing style in terms of the score? I mean, you, you, um, you both have, you both work on the music. Or yeah, the yeah, like the, the music. Songs, yeah, I should say the music is. Um, it's definitely contemporary musical theatre, yeah. which throws a lot of people because of the era. Mm. Yeah. They think it's more... quite American, the song I was yeah. listening to. Yeah, yeah. 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 but it definitely. felt very modern New York almost. Yeah, mm. I think a lot of people say American as well, um, which I'm not surprised because I think you've grown up listening to them in the American songbook type of thing, so that's definitely going to be yeah. an influence. Um, but definitely contemporary musical theatre and a l- definitely a lot of jazz is thrown in. Um, and you're, you're the composer? Yes. And you're the lyricist, or do you both tackle lyrics together? Both. Yeah, yeah. 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 And obviously, you write the book. So yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's fair. I mean, obviously, it's, it's greyer than that. But there's yeah, a, that's it is. A, yeah, if, yeah, if, if you wanted a pinpoint, if you, yeah. you could. But it is a lot greater. You know, you've done a lot of input into the script, and you know, yeah. musically, sometimes I've done bits and yeah. sent it to Grant, and it's it's yeah. progressing. Well, it has to be a liaison, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's uh, fairly American sound. Now you say people say that not jars, but it's not what they expect. No, they don't so, expect. People think yeah. expect more legit style of show. <laughs> then, <laughs> right. So this is illegit, is it? Yeah, it's more <laughs> legit as in the yes. kind of Roger Hammerstein, that type of big American song, but type music. More what they expect. Yes. yes. But that's, that's 60, 70 years out of date already. Yes. I mean, you know, when, when you said you're fans of the American songbook, do you mean the modern American songbook? Oh, yeah, well, I say I'm a fan. I've, I mean, I grew up on it. Yes. So you're, un, you're gonna, those influences are going to be going to mm. come out in your writing but style. But modern musicals sound quite, quite different from sort of 50s, 60s musicals, which sound quite, quite different from 30s ones as well, don't they? Yeah, but totally. They're, everything's yeah. got their own style and their own composers have got their own mark. So you're a contemporary writer in that sense of music? Uh, yes, yeah. oh, definitely. I think yeah. we've got... I like to think the music's got a stamp on it that's ours. And I think when people that we know us, they listen to it. If they haven't, don't know the show, we just play them the song, they can tell it's our writing. Which yeah, is, so, I was, so I, I, that's I think from our ba- yeah good. because from our years of writing musical ballads, pop ballads, and stuff like that, I think yeah they can go oh yeah okay I can hear that it's it's that your sounds style. like your yeah, style. There's a Martin and Tower Tower and Martin yes. sound. Yes, yeah, yeah. I don't quite know what it is. Yeah, but apparently gonna, it's there. Damn you! Because <laughs> yeah. that, was my, that was my next question. <laughs> Are you able to identify what it is that makes it idiosyncratically yours? I can. Um, <laughs> I don't, no, I, 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 I don't know. Um, in a way, that's good because it means it's just naturally there, and you're, you know, if, you, if you're not looking for the hooks, then it means you'll produce them naturally again in the future. Whereas mm. start, you'll start pastiching yourself if someone says you do A, B, C, and D, mm. and you'll always think, oh dear, is this yeah. A, B, C, and D ish enough? Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I think we always constantly try and push into other directions. Yeah. I think because we, we got to a point where we were writing so many musical ballads and, and you know pop ballads and kind of thing, and we were like. It was like let's try and let's do some try and do some dance even if it's not mm. going to work. But let's just try and do that. Let's try and do something different. Must have tempo. No, yeah, yeah I think it was, that do. was you the want case. to as a writer and a composer, you want to give yourself <coughs> challenges after a while. Mm. No limits to write, just to write something differently and write in a different style. Yeah, I mean, we had, you know, we was able to do that with people on a different show that we were asked to write for, and having written for Newland yeah. for so many years, and that's that music is ingrained because I mean, it's still being rewritten. You're still going back to it, so it's yeah, still yeah. you know every day of your life some element of Newland crops up. So you, you're but as you're putting as you're travelling up to Edinburgh in three days after this yeah. no, no, we'll no, no. need to stop that soon. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, that that's in place. Yes, yeah. That's in place. You mean the, the masterwork? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. But it was again it was nice just to revisit a different type of show and have to write in a different style and just so as a composer mm. and a writer it's just it's great to have that challenge. Now you've been workshopping it over the um, last few last years. Last year, yes. yes yeah. So um, has it been performed in its full two and a half hour glory? Yes, yes. It, was, it, it was performed um, at the uh, was it Giant Olive, um, the Lion and Unicorn Theatre. Yeah, Kentucky. very similar name. No, it's, <laughs> it's the Giant Olive Theatre company, company, isn't it? Yes. But it's, it's the yeah. I, I, I call it there. Giant Olive, but it's not. It's yeah. it's the Lion and Unicorn, um, and basically that was our our big showcase uh, of the show, full run of the show. Yeah. And how did that go, both from your points of view as well as your uh, your happy public? From from a writing point of view, it was invaluable. Yeah. Um, because we'd workshopped it and done so many read-throughs and tryouts and showcases that we just had, it got to a stage where we couldn't do any more. We had mm. to get in front of an audience yeah. and see what works and what didn't. And we just we threw a lot of material at that at that time. And I think we just had to wait to see an audience say, yes, we love that, we want more of that. That didn't work, let's lose that. And you could tell, could you? Oh, it yeah. was good. Well, our biggest yeah. fear was people going to, everyone was going to like and dislike all different things. Yes. But there was a general consensus. Yeah. People liked and disliked the same thing. So we knew, we had a very clear direction of which well, way really to go with it. I think, yeah, I mean, I mean, we also, we, we got a review as well, which yeah. wasn't, wasn't a nice review. And the problem is, I think, is the guy came thinking 
this is they're doing a West End musical in this small little black room and he he didn't like it in the slightest. And however I think it was overly harsh. However, going through it and looking through the points that he made, and then we'd watch the show, I think, because we got it quite early on, and we were watching the show back, and I think we looked at it and went, we can improve that. And I think from mm. after the first night, once we were just grateful that we had done the first night, it was looking through the show and going, that could change, and we can do that, and we can do this. And to be honest, I don't know how you feel, but I think four shows in, at that point, I was ready to, to go, the, yeah, let, to let, let's just one. stop this now. I want to just oh, right. start it's, rewriting and get yes. the next version of it The workshop had done its yes. task already. Yeah. So yeah. how long was that one? It was only it was, it was a week. week. It was only a week. Oh, right. a week. Um, yeah. But I mean, also because you know, cast of eleven, radio mics, band, band. Yeah. We had a four-piece band, costume, some sort of set, and no production. Team. Yeah, this this oh. is just me and me and Grant team, doing it, yeah. and it's it was a massive. Been there, done that. Right, <laughs> I used that. I used to there too. <laughs> yeah. God, yeah, so did I. Well, I'm going grey. <laughs> so, but well, well boo hoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that that was it was so important. Yeah. So, so yeah. important. But consequently, the script is, I think, significantly, a significant step forward yeah. and quite different in places. It's yeah. much more oh, we, focused. One character's completely gone because it was he's taken up time and ultimately that could be oh, used yeah. elsewhere. And Got it, to be brutal. Yeah, it was so, so important yeah. and I'm so pleased we did that. But it's just one, <laughs> so of, the, it's one of the stages, pleased. I think, as a just to get a new musical off the ground, you've just got to go mm. through. Yeah. So that run was when? That was Easter. And you, oh, this year? This year. Yeah. You had already decided that Edinburgh was looming then? Yes, we'd, oh, we'd, we'd booked already booked. Yes. Edinburgh was already booked. We knew it was going to do it. But and we, we booked April pretty much off because we had Edinburgh. We thought we've, we've got to do a run. Yeah. And oh, we're so thankful yeah. because we're so glad that we were able to identify what needed the work rather than get to Edinburgh and think, oh, oh yes, God. Like now, yeah. yeah, exactly. But, oh, here, yeah, but, yeah. but that, that, forgive me, that time scale seems tremendously tight to me because we're talking April for Easter? Mm. Yes. We're talking August for the uh, for the uh, yeah. for the Edinburgh run. That's not a large number of months, and so there's reworking that needs to be done. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and some of it fairly significant if you're yes. losing actual characters. Yes. Yep. Oh, yep. New Huge. songs that have to be yes. created. Yep. And you've also got to then trim it down for an Edinburgh-sized bite. Hour and yeah. So yeah. now you know. So whilst you're improving yep. the whole show for its two and a half hour yep. sort of master position, then yep. there's the uh, the further edit. Yeah. We In didn't get much sleep. Yes. We yeah. didn't get much sleep. How are you doing? <laughs> both? Um, I think. I but think did, you, you managed it in a way that you're both satisfied that you. Have been able to do it. Yeah. You know, yes, definitely. I'm yeah, I'm really proud of the script now. Yeah, so am I actually. I, I mean, although I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get halfway through Edinburgh and, and we we'll want to even tweak change it that. More. And yeah, I but mean, that's what it is, really, isn't it? It's rewriting continuously until you get a, the strongest product you, you think, can. Yeah. I mean, uh, that was the thing. I mean, we also we we have gone from that two and a half, two and a half hour script and we've gone down to an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, we know what needs to go into that. When we becomes another two hour, you know, two hour show because we know things that needed, you know, a little bit more depth to it and stuff like that. However, the hour and a half script, it was the hardest thing to do was getting rid of and what's important and cutting down. Mm. I mean, okay, that's a very useful exercise when you say yes. what's important. Yeah, yeah. Then that means that everything you've, I mean, when you come to rebuild it again after Edinburgh, you will have to then seriously think about those bits you've taken out. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah, definitely. I, I think, I think we already know. I think just from looking at the run. I mean, we did a. We did a run a couple of weeks ago. It was the first time, about two two weeks ago. Which we, is your we, Edinburgh size run? Isn't yes, it? yeah, and we. And we, we it's our we, first run with the cast. Yeah, After we, weeks of rehearsals. We did. The we first said, "Let's go run. for it," and we and we did it. And I was so pleasantly surprised. I know it's my own stuff, but I was so pleasantly no, no, surprised. You're not surprised. No one else was. I was, I was <laughs> terrified. <laughs> but I was well, surprised we were terrified. Yeah, we were both terrified how it, how it was going to look. However, it 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 was just. I was so happy with the changes that we'd made and the state it was in. And I was like, "This is." something that I'm going to be proud of now at Edinburgh, definitely. Yes. Uh, it just still strikes me as being such a tight timescale. When did you write your last song for it? Um, three weeks ago? Yeah, maybe. Oh, right. Might have been. So there, but, there has maybe. been dust settlement time. Yeah, oh, oh, yes, no, yes. yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, the thing as well is you got to remember, we kept... Because when we, when we knew we were doing April, we, at that point, had said to people, we need confirmation on if you're coming to Edinburgh. Yeah. So we, we've we kept, what, 70% of the cast? Yes. Um, oh, there's no way we could have done it if we had if we lost all our cast. Yeah, oh, yeah you know, then it would have been pointless. Yeah, but I mean, 75% of your band, aren't you? You've gone down for 43. Right? Yes. yes. Yeah. We've got, yeah, drums, bass and piano. We unfortunately lost a guitarist. but That was clumsy. Yeah, yeah. we lost him. I don't know where he is. <laughs> <laughs> Try the bread bit. <laughs> um, no, seriously, um, but th- th- that in itself isn't uh, insurmountable then? Or? No, not really. I mean, you, with a... 
I think a, a score, even just with a piano, should hold up. Mm. If it doesn't hold up with a piano, you've got you don't have a show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So any any other instrument, it's just nice. just just again just builds another layer. It's for cherry on the top of your bake roll, is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You're not actually saying that, obviously. <laughs> only a full load. Um, <laughs> and he did. So um, <laughs> splendid. So how how are you feeling now? You're travelling up in three days, four days from this. this yeah, point uh, Wednesday of the first we travel up. Yeah. Um, we've got two more rehearsals on the Monday and the Tuesday. Well, yeah, we're going to have here an open. Yeah, yes, here in we're going to have an open dress run on the Tuesday. Um, <laughs> that sounds faintly unhygienic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, a little bit unnecessary. <laughs> but uh, so we're going to we're going to run the show there um, in front of some people. Yeah. Um, well, we've got we're, we've got a theatre very kindly. Um, yeah. And so we're kind of doing a fake yeah. install because we have such little time up in Edinburgh as I'm sure you yeah. know to get in and out so we're going to try and Do replicate can, yeah. it here yeah. throw the cast into a theatre lights props mics band and just to see shout at them can tell do them it. to do it and see if it does yes. work. Yeah, yeah. And because you, I mean, forgive me, you won't have any rehearsal time at all in your venue up in Edinburgh, will you? Which is, by the way, let, let's let's hear when and where. We might as well get that in early. Oh, it's Surgeons Hall, um, venue fifty-three. Is that yeah? And it's is, it, is that the Grand Theatre? Yeah, or? the Grand Theatre, Surgeons Hall, part of um, uh, space. Of course, the Grand Theatre in the Surgeons Hall might not be a theatre as we understand it. It could be an operating theatre. Oh, right. <laughs> no, it's, so it's they, quite they a big box, yeah. so it could yeah. work. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've been, we went there before because the, last year we went to Edinburgh to, to yeah, scout, scout out the area, basically. A and, uh, yeah, basically, and we looked at certain theatres, what would be plausible. But again, it's great that we did that because... Oh, yeah. We, you can only get so much from looking oh, online. You and have to yeah. see. It. I don't understand how people can book their shows into venues without knowing what they're getting. But, yeah. but what's your turnaround time? Twenty minutes in, twenty minutes out, or is fifteen? It so you've you've booked it for two hours. Yeah. So you've got fifteen minutes, then show, then fifteen. Oh, yeah. Well, good luck. I look forward to visiting you in your sanatorium. <laughs> um, but the Social Hall is a very nice venue, actually. So that's uh, and it feels very grand too. So that's that's so nice. Give <laughs> you that sense of august uh, grandeur that one so desperately needs in all things. And it's becoming of a creative team, if I may say. <laughs> um, so you're up on Wednesday, and you're dragging your cast with you, I think. One of you's going up in a van with people. I'm, I'm, going, taking yeah, a cast I'm going up in a van with, with lots of props and, and set and suitcases and instruments, and I'm driving, so that's going to take me yeah. twice as long as you guys in cars, probably. Um, and then there's a bunch of people going in cars, and there's a few people flying over, I think, as well. Yes. Or train, yeah. yeah. Good. And then Tuesdays are tech. We've got we do have a tech in the theatre for we get three, three, three hours. hours. Three hours, so it's it's not a chance to run anything. No, really. no, no. It's, it's just not, yeah. the sound Extra levels. Your, your normal shows, so yeah. it's yeah. very limited, isn't it? Yeah, it's just to get the set in. How often are you on? Well, on every night, um, bar Sundays at eight fifteen. At the Surgeon's Hall. At the Surgeon's Hall, yeah. Venue fifty three. That's the one, yeah. It. It, it bears reiterating. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely, yeah. Please so, come see. <laughs> so, do you have ambitions for Newland after Edinburgh? Well, we took, we're taking it up to Edinburgh really to see if, if it's got legs. Yeah, what if anybody get, is interested in it, or if it can go somewhere after that? Mm. It, that is the breeding ground at the moment for any new writing, really. Yeah. Um, oh, I agree. And a lot Fring, of fringe is where it's at. Yeah, and a lot of new new shows are getting recognised and uh, finding success on the back of a peer in Edinburgh. Yes. So mm. we, I mean, we're not having suddenly delusions of it's suddenly going to be transferred anywhere. But it is huge. Path. But, it is but yeah, path. if yeah. it maybe just a small production team sees anything in it and will take it on to a small few yeah, theatres. Yeah, I think that's the next step. That's the thing. It's just a great opportunity for a lot of people and hopefully a lot of important people that have the power to go. Let's put that on somewhere. I mean, that's ideally what we want. We just want yeah. the show to get around um, and be seen by a lot of people basically yeah so I think Edinburgh is a great place for that to happen yeah personal question now for you both different answers probably what do you think you've learned or what will you take with you from this production what will I take with me or what can you take from the Edinburgh production well let's put it this way from from writing the piece let's ask the question as of today what has surprised you what what, what's what's what I bit of the, luggage is going to emotionally think, is going to hang around for you? I don't. I think the process itself. I mean, I've M'd, I've MD'd many years. It's what I do. It's yeah. my professional job. Um, but doing your own thing and having to be so hands-on, there's still new stuff that crops up, and I'm thinking I've never had to deal with that before, and new challenges that you've got to face, and still, it's it's emotionally challenging. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah. Sometimes you don't take, you don't have time to take stock as well either. Mm. And you? 
Yeah, I think I think one definitely the the process of it all. I mean, we knew we were going to have to do lots of rewrites. We knew we had to do, but it's it's just how valuable all of that is. Learning what didn't work, why didn't it work, and just evaluating your script over and over again. I mean, the amount of times we've spoke about our script, gone through it, is countless, and that's it's so important. And I think feedback. it's something that doesn't happen enough. People don't work. filter. Mm. No, I agree. No, and I think even a lot on of television, you see things where you think that's two drafts short of a final yes, version. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I think I think that's that's been really. But incredible. we're not we're not precious about the material, and I think you can't. Mm. No, but I, I think some some shows and some writers are, and you see things professionally put on mm. around London. They're still vanity projects. Yeah. yeah, I think I think growing up acting and doing the music that we've done, I think we've we've grown a bit. Up. Not hard, but we, we've we've we're, we matured, we're, not, advanced, not even mature. No, just aging, just able. Decrepit. What, 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 what are you going for? <laughs> What's that word? No, <laughs> just just able to take on criticism, yes. and being yeah. able to constructively use that. And I think, I think that's just from growing up from how we are with people and asking honest, honest opinions of people. Well, you sound both very sound on. The, if you, that's what a dreadful sentence that was. <laughs> you both seem very sound on that. You both have this sensible, mature approach, which to me. Uh, you know, you're talking quite dispassionately about your work, but with enthusiasm, which is mm. almost the best combination. Because there are people, you know, I've, I've, had, I've interviewed many people who are truly enthusiastic, which is lovely, but they're also protective to the point it's probably damaging yes. their work and they can't see it. Yeah. yeah. And then there are people who can never let go. Yeah. So there will come a point when you have to stop Newland and go on to your next piece. Because mm. I've known people sort of... Um, Sort of, uh, mollycoddle their baby as it were and uh, mm. uh, for years and years and years rewriting and rewriting it it's, you know it's not going to get anywhere and you start obsessing yeah. and uh, they, they lose all perspective yeah uh, like a good Egyptian drawing so. oh, I'm yeah. sure there's probably come a point when we say we've got the piece to the, the strongest that we feel that we can do it but I don't yeah. think we're there yet no I don't and, and also you know yeah we're doing Newland we've got our other projects yes Ready in and slowly Even doing land. things. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, super new land. Um, but yeah, no. So we've got other things that I think once, hopefully, if Newland gets taken off our hands a little bit and it gets, you know, a production team takes it on, we can start fully yeah. getting on with, with other stuff as well. But it's important, isn't it, to develop a portfolio just professionally yes. if you're on longer term. I think so. Yeah. yeah, I think it's also a learning experience as well. We've like nine oh, years, seven I mean, years with Newland. So much of what we've done here into another project yeah, and we'll be able to tackle another project with all that experience yes because those experiences will actually act as not shortcuts but well, I suppose it will be shortcuts mm. because you won't have to I'll relearn it yes, it's really yeah, yeah. we're so yeah. much more what works script wise what yeah. musicals yeah. have to have what they shouldn't have um, and we already had a fair bit of knowledge about that having been in the industry for a while yeah. but until you do it and you get it out there you, you just don't know it's very interesting and may I say very pleasing to, to meet a couple of uh, creators, songwriters, composers, show people who, you yeah. see I struggle for a particular <laughs> editor Love it. Um, or noun, um, who are both aware and supportive of their own new work but at the same time are learning what they need to learn for a career hmm. um, because some people can be, as I say, it goes no further than the current production and I'm not getting that at all, which I'm now going to have to eat my words when I say, <laughs> without giving me any details, what milestones you have next along the line? What is Newland 2? What is Newland 2? <laughs> oh, what, you mean like as in newer shows? or? Mm, yeah. um, you must be bubbling up, presumably. We, we've, yeah, we've got a few things. There's there's one which we don't really have a title for, which is... Difficult to describe that one, then. Yeah, it, 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 at one <laughs> yeah. point it was called Love in London, which is a ridiculous title, and then there was Pinch Punch. I'm, I'm sure uh, Richard Curtis will steal it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yeah, but it's, it's kind of... It's, it's got, you it, know... It depends kind of, really, because this... Newland is... It's definitely it's a mainstream commercial show, mm. but we've tried to keep a strong artistic vibe running through it. Yep. And I think is that's it's always finding that balance because you know shows are either mainstream lowest common denominator or highbrow type of show, I, and yes. it's finding that middle ground. I think, and I think newly yeah. we've tried to keep it accessible but with a strong artistic thing running through it, so that it's it can appeal to as wide an audience as possible, but like serious musical theatre audience and students and people with appreciation yeah. can latch onto it. I think actually going back to your earlier point as well on, on us not being not precious about it, but you know like uh, just talking dispassionately and, and, and how I think I think there's you do have to find the middle ground between it's art and it is a work of art, but it's also a piece of entertainment. Mm. 
and ultimately I want people to go and have a great time and enjoy a good piece of art but entertain and I think I think there's too many people that get very precious about oh it's a piece of art and it means this and it's and we people want to go to the theatre to have a good time but it doesn't have to be a rubbish good time oh, that makes no, sense you know no, what I mean it, it doesn't it have to be absolute sense no I, I absolutely believe mm. in intelligent things also being enjoyable but then yeah. I think if you look at a lot of what's in the West End a lot of this yes. art is, <laughs> is pure mainstream frivolous I drove you to Candor and Ebb yeah. and their song It's a Business <laughs> from <Kirk>. <laughs> <laughs> well Grant and Tom, thank you so much for talking about Newland, and I'm going to be coming to see it in Edinburgh, so I hope perhaps I'll have another chance to see you again uh, and discuss it further. But, firstly, let me wish you a great success. I, I hope, and I'm sure it shall be. Remind us again how people can see it. Uh, it's at Surgeon's Hall, venue 53, uh, the space venue on Nicholson Street, at 8.15 every day of the week. Apart from Sundays. Apart from Sundays. <laughs> And people can see that at Ed Fringe, which is Ed Fringe or the Space website. Yeah, or you could go to if you search Newland Musical on Facebook, you'll find our page with lots of information and pictures and stuff. And you might choose to like it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> become our friend. <laughs> so lovely to speak to you both. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And you Thank very you. kindly said that we can play a song from Newland. So in a way, this is sort of a broadcasting premiere, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. So we're delighted. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what we're going to hear. Um, well, this is uh, effectively the eleventh hour ballad from the show. Well, it's, it's a long uh, show then, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the title track is um, I Thought I Knew Him. It's uh, sung by uh, lead heroine Rose, who is distraught and coming to terms with not being able to be with the man that she loves. Grant and Tom, thank you very much indeed. Thank you Cheers, very much. Thanks. There are so many things that I don't understand How could he look in my eyes And say I am all a man ever needs Say I love you, then say goodbye
Well, that was Grant and Tom, and it was really nice speaking to them. It turns out we'd all been at the Edinburgh Fringe last year, and we had a good old reminisce about what was brilliant and what was perhaps less brilliant. A very interesting conversation. I only wish I'd recorded it. If you want to find out more about Newland the Musical, and I hope that you will, there are two places to go to, facebook.com, which, as you know, is a well-known social networking internet site. So that's facebook.com, oblique, Newland Musical. Or you could go to twitter.com, a similarly well-known social networking internet site. That's twitter.com, oblique, Newland Musical. And, of course, you can find out more on Ed Fringe the all-encompassing search engine for the shows on at this year's Edinburgh Fringe. Don't forget, go to YouTube and you can hear music from both Bereavement and Newland and see a little bit of some of the workshops for both those shows. They both look fabulous to me and I am definitely going. Well, what's the third musical today? Well, it's a kind of cabaret musical and it features someone that we all know very well here on Musical Talk, David Kingsmill. So what's it about? Well... Do you know, I don't think I'm going to tell you. Let's hear the opening theme for this new show. There comes a time once every few decades when the world comes to be in need of a new kind of superhero. Mr. Millennium! is not it. He does not possess super strength. He does not know Kung Fu. He even had his driving license taken away. Nevertheless, he uses his unique power to tune into radio to fight injustice wherever and whenever he can. If he can get there in time. David, Hello. Nice, nice to speak to you again. And you? Now, we met because of Edinburgh 2011. Indeed. And your um, great success, Hitler the Musical. <laughs> yes. You're back again for 2012 yes. with uh, another, I've got to say, offbeat, um, curious musical. <laughs> um, Very much so. Come on, give us a title. Uh, it's called Mr. Millennium Issue Number One. If, if you're looking it up, incidentally, on the Fringe website, you need to look up number is N-O full stop. Oh, Although it's, it, should, it should be a hash, but apparently the Edinburgh system doesn't But if, if you look up the word millennium... Mille- the Miss, if you look up Mr. Millennium, it's vibrant yellow and purple, and it's the first thing that comes up, so you won't have any problem finding it. And you're classified as cabaret rather than musical, but that's one of the problems with the Edinburgh Fringe classification system, because uh, there are so many shows that can only pick one term when they really... Absolutely. Well, you can pick three, because you pick your actual classification as to which section of the book you go in, or which section of the programme you go in, and then your two subgenres. But I really think that theatre being what it is... Yes. Virtually every single show slips through the gaps and you end up having to pigeonhole yourself. So yes, I think I'm down as cabaret and then uh, comedy and musical theatre, but I'm not... Well, yes, it's only half true. It's not a full comedy. It's got some serious moments. But anyone listening will immediately say, hang on a minute, Mr Millennium number one? Yes. But that can only mean that it's... The conceit must be, therefore, a comic book of some variety. That's what it says, isn't it? Kind of, yes. Absolutely. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's quite deliberately... The character is not a comic book character, but he is a superhero. Uh, he is a superhero in our everyday world. And the conceit behind the show, without giving too much away, is that his power is extremely limited... It's internal, so he can't pick up a car, he can't fly. In actual fact, he sings about wanting to fly at one point. He can't show off in any way, and nobody believes he's a superhero, and therefore they spend most of their time ridiculing him for running around in a brightly coloured costume. Whereas in actual fact, he does have a power, but it's limited so much that he's he can't be effective enough to become famous. (laughs) So... Let, let, let's start at the beginning. I can think of no better place. <laughs> so, how? I mean, when did you decide, first of all, that you were going to come back to Edinburgh in 2012? Um, and then what were your thought patterns? I decided I was going to come back in Edinburgh 2012 about halfway through Edinburgh 2011, I think. Splendid. When, when, by which time Hitler was already a bona fide blue chip hit? Yes. Um, 
and I didn't know what I was going to come back with. Obviously, my own Broken cabaret. Arm. Well, yeah, <laughs> quite. My own cabaret was uh, rather more limited success. Although I enjoyed it. those people who came to see it, yes, on on the whole, I got some excellent feedback. Got to make um, the rubber ducky. Indeed, yes. I'm trying to work out how to fit him into Mr. Millennium, and it's really, <laughs> really hard. That sounds like an episode of Casualty. It, well, <laughs> I, I fear you might be right if I actually do it. I think it will just derail the whole thing, but I'm going to have a go. I came up with the idea towards the end of last year that actually the best thing for me to do was a military drama based on the action that my grandfather took part in in the Second World War. How interesting. And I have spent, I spent something like... seven or eight months writing this I've co-written a script with a director friend of mine uh, which I think is a really strong script it's not quite finished but it's a very strong script and circumstances beyond my control forced me to cancel that show and but it's still in drawing books day, so, you, uh, so you've, it's there it for will happen time. at some point in Good. time yes but for now my, my it's irony actually having done a mili- well a World War II related show after a fashion and <laughs> yes. A cabaret last year. I started on a World War Two show, and I'm now doing a cabaret. Yeah. But well, yes. yes, when it when it collapsed, um, I couldn't really work out what to do next. And it was my fiance actually gave me the idea. She said, "Why don't you do another cabaret?" And it's the logical thing because I was I was contracted into my venue. I was contracted into my flat in Edinburgh. But more and to you the know, you can do it. Well, you did it before. Yes, although I've got much less time than I did last year. But more to the point, I wanted to do it because I love Edinburgh it's an extraordinary experience and I wanted to make sure I went up and um, our listeners probably don't know actually that I'm disappearing off to Canada as of September of this year so So it's also it is my swan song yes because I'm only in London for a week after Edinburgh finishes so I'm not actually going to be here long enough to perform anything else so this will be my last performance here for quite some time I would imagine barring some miraculous rise to fame um and so I wanted to make sure I did it. And about four days, my, my, dis- my standard description of what happened is that Mr. Millennium tripped down a flight of stairs and landed in my head, <laughs> which he really just did. I've been, over the past few years, I've been getting into the Marvel films. I was never a comic addict. I've, I, I think the only comics I ever read were Mighty Max, which weren't, they were based on a little game oh, right, okay. of figures that you could collect as a child. I never really read any of the Marvel or DC comics. Um, the Beano, maybe, the Funday Times, whatever it was. But I've been developing an obsession with particularly the Marvel Universe um, and the concept of superheroes. And all of a sudden I thought, well, what would happen if you had a bit of a failure as a superhero? And so my original idea was to come up with a superhero who was just a complete klutz and couldn't do anything right. And over time that evolved into this idea of actually, well, he is a failure, but he's not a failure by the fact that he's useless. He's a failure by the fact that his power doesn't give him the power of your Spider-Mans, your Batmans, or whatever. And he is very, very limited. So he tries to help and really can't a lot of the time. So the the intention is excellent. (laughs) The intention is superb. He really wants to do good and to help people but he has now spent a very long time being ridiculed being prank called so that he can be ridiculed and essentially expending an awful lot of effort with very little in the way of positive comeback but he saved one man who had fallen down a manhole a workman who was on his lunch break or or, all of his friends had gone on lunch and he'd fallen down a manhole and injured himself And he saved that one man who was really, really appreciative. And because he knows he saved that one man, he keeps going and keeps trying to help, even though he doesn't have much success. I like the the intent. I think that's very (laughs) interesting. Did you you ever see a film a few years ago called Mystery Men, I think it was called? I saw it about a month and a half ago. Oh, right. I think one of the conceits I liked in that, there was one superhero who could do his stuff as long as nobody was looking at him. Yes, the invisible boy. He could never be seen. Yes, he was invisible if no one looked at him. Yes, um, which I thought was brilliant. Yes, yeah. yeah, a fantastic. No, I, I went into HMV a while ago and said I want some spoof superhero films just to, just for the sake of getting myself into the mood because obviously I've been into particularly recently the most um, having sent most of my DVD collection to Canada and expecting to do a military show. The only yes. superhero films I actually kept were the Batman ones, which are very dark. So I wanted something yes. a bit lighter. And mystery, I picked Unless up Unless you watched the original '60s version. <laughs> this is true, yes, but they, I, I, I follow. I prefer to follow things that are true to the canon of what they're actually. 
um, representing. I say junk it all and make me laugh. But there we are. That's, to that's be fair, you, that's where you and I, I are used different. to. I used to watch the sixties version when I was yeah. young. I've just it's not my taste now. But um, yeah, and I did watch Mystery Men, and actually, yeah. yes, it, I think there's a, there's there's a lot of humour in that. I haven't. I don't think I've taken anything directly from it in terms of inspiration, but it certainly put me in the mood. Yes. So you had to finish with the show that you were hoping to do so when did this moment of epiphany happen when when did he trip down the steps in your mind um in the first week of june of this year of this year right so that's... i am working to a very very restricted timeline at the moment and yet you've done wonderful things already because um there's a logo you're in you know i've seen i found you on the uh, the ed fringe website yes um i know you've been working like a, a trojan to get um yeah yeah songs written and, and at the, at, and... at time of speaking i am about half a song away from having all the music finished. Really? So it is with, it's in within grasping distance? Absolutely. I've got um, seven songs plus his theme tune. So here's a question then. So you start at the beginning of June. You've yes. got everything booked, so you know you're committed. You've got yes. an idea, but as yet undeveloped. What then? I mean, uh, you know... How, Blind how panic to... for about a week. <laughs> but are you one of these composers, you know, people talk about in musical theatre, they, they go to a tryout, they have to dump a song and come up with a, an award-winning song within 24 hours, and some people really thrive on that. Whereas there's the alternative theory, which I've also heard, but if you've, if you've written a song in 24 hours, it's not going to be very good. Well, actually, I think I'm a combination of the two. Um, I'm not saying that I'm writing hit songs by any means, but I think I'm writing songs... I believe I'm writing songs that are good and the people I've played them to have laughed or felt sad yeah. or whatever they're supposed to feel yeah. with one notable exception which is the one I haven't finished yet and ah. it's absolutely driving me up the wall because I know what I want it to be about I know the style I want it to be in and I've written a chorus and a bridge for it and the verses just aren't coming and it's absolutely just making me insane and at the are moment. you doing your own lyrics? I'm doing yeah well for the most part um, I have two collaborators in this show this time which is I have collaborated with a friend of mine on the mostly on the lyrics and with a tiny bit of the music of one song and I have also borrowed a song wholesale from James Mikolos who we spoke to last year who wrote the very excellent apply within indeed because I saw a review of his songs he did called Up and Away at the uh, Charing Cross or New Players or whatever it was called at the time and it just fits this show too perfectly not to be included. Uh, and so I sent him a very begging email saying, do you mind if I use this? And he said, that's absolutely fine. So I've had one song provided to me wholesale, and I've had one song where I've only done half the work. Um, I've also taken two songs from my cabaret last year, which fit the bill. Yep. And the other three are my own, and, and the theme tune, are my compositions and lyrics are all mine, yes. But how did you create the story? Because you, you obviously have an idea about how Mr. Millennium came to be and his attitude to the world, but you've got to fill uh, an auditorium for presumably, what, 55 minutes to an hour? Uh, 45 minutes, I've said. Um, the venue this year, my hour slot includes my get-in and get-out, so oh. I have to be quite prompt, whereas last year I had 10 minutes either side to work. You're going to have to roll out a piano and a duck, so it was all right. <laughs> well, exactly. No, this, this year it's nothing on stage that I can't carry on mid-show. Uh, I wanted to keep, for a start, he's going to be quite a dynamic character and I wanted him to be able to move around quite freely for second when you're actually telling where last year my conceit could involve me sitting down and playing songs because the question was what is it like if life were a musical here the story doesn't involve a piano diegetic music would look silly and it would actually interrupt the show if I sat down at the piano every time I wanted to play so I am pre-recorded I am pre-recording the music Gosh. yes which puts an emphasis on you as the performer as well, then, to make sure you don't muff up your own song. It most certainly does. Yeah. Um, and I am going to rehearse the living daylights out of it with the recordings to make sure that my timing's right. So, last year, your, your cabaret, the one you've just described, in fact, um, the, the, it, wasn't, it wasn't so much an arc, it was an exploration. Yes. Um, you're being quite enigmatic for understandable reasons about Mr Millennium and his skills and what he might be able to do or not. Um, so is this also an exploration or is there a narrative arc? It's an exploration. I mean, basically what happens is that he has been prank called again and somebody has prank called him and said, we need help, and he charges into the theatre and realises there's nobody in there that actually yes. needs saving at all. He's been set up. He's been, he's been set up so that everyone can have a good old laugh at him. And he gets in and he realises that there's an audience sitting there and he says, well, you know what? You think you know what it's like to be a superhero. There's all these films where everything's glitz and glamour and the hero always gets the girl. Well, this is what it's really like. Um, and it's yes, it's an exploration in the sense of it's 
what is it like to be a superhero, but it is also telling his story. So the first song of the show is actually a retrospective. It's oh, what it? he was thinking of life before he became yes. empowered. And the last song of the show is what he's going to move on to do after he leaves the theatre. So there is a transition, there is a story behind the character, but it's overlaid with, well, this is me, and what would it be like if I did this? So um, his anecdotes, his exploration of himself, absolutely. His, um, his discovery of himself in some yeah, sense, both historically and in the future. Well, he takes the opportunity of the fact that he's got a captive audience, yeah. basically, to be slightly conceited and say, this is me. He's, it's, it's not an autobiography by any yeah. means, but it's his opportunity to put himself out there and say, well, look, I'm a person too. Just because I can do something you can't do doesn't mean that I can stand here and take the fact that everybody laughs at me. Now let's just talk about one or two of the trappings of the piece because uh, <laughs> you very kindly showed me a photograph just before we started recording. <laughs> yes, which of, nobody else other than my yeah. fiancé is ever going to get to see. I feel very flattered there. Um, <laughs> of, well, let's just say a, a striking young man in a superhero costume. Yes, made of yellow and purple lycra. Now, which lucky soul is going to be wearing this? <laughs> that would be me. And you're going to be wearing it both on stage and presumably up and down the Royal Mile, aren't you? Yes, not for the entire day. No, no, um, no, no, no. But I will clean periodically. Yes, quite. But I will probably spend a good couple of hours a day at various points running up and down the mile making a spectacle of myself. Very good. Um, which I could probably do without the costume, but the costume That's just That's a different kind of spectacle again. Well, this is yes, true. Fine. Absolutely. So you have your superhero costume. Well, I, I will have it. Yes, um, you have a logo. At, at, it's a Tuesday at the moment, and I am getting it on Friday morning, which I am inordinately excited about. I was sitting. I was. I've, I was having this costume pinned to me. It's 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 being tailor made for me yeah. by uh, a lovely costume tailor called Sally Ann Dixie, who, um, whilst has has done lots of stage and screen work, she actually developed. Um, the leather work for Red Skull and Captain America. Oh, right, okay. So she has actually got a bit of she's superhero yeah. legacy, if you like. Um, but uh, I think she's having quite a lot of fun actually designing this. But it's a proper tailor-made costume being made for me. And I was there yesterday, on uh, so that's Monday, having bits and pieces of lycra pinned to me and a cape pinned to my shoulders and a cowl, a cowl stuck yeah. over my head. And childhood geek was just leeching out of me all over the place. It was just so much fun having this. Because I've, much as I've never been into the superhero canon, I, I think there's a part of everybody who wants to be able to do something that a superhero can do. Also, as a performer, surely dressing up can't be a bad thing. Well, too. absolutely, absolutely. But I, I watched. I, I was saying to you just before we started, I saw the new Spider-Man film, and much as I, I you know, I think so much of it. Um, there's a, a couple of one. It's in 3D. Then there's a couple of wonderful sequences where you actually see him swinging through the city from first-person perspective, and you see his hand just coming out under the camera, and you really feel for a moment like you could be him. And I was just sitting there in the theatre just going, yes! But I'm afraid I, I, I look at the old world of um, Kenny Everett, who's a big uh, TV comic <laughs> in the 80s and 90s. Yes. And um, there was a live-action Spider-Man series in America at the time, and Kenny Everett spoofed it, and he made the very good point. There's a famous sketch where he's dressed head-to-toe in the Spider-Man costume. Yeah. He desperately need, needs to pop to the lavatory, so he runs it and stands in front of the urinal, and then suddenly realises, of course, that there's no fly. Yeah. And indeed, <laughs> there's no way out of the costume very Which easily. is absolute, and that's one of the things I'm going to lampoon in the course yeah. of the... Oh, because jolly. it's yeah. absolutely true. Superhero costume, there's going to be an entire monologue and possibly a bit of a song devoted yeah. to superhero costume. And how would you put one on? I mean, if I was Spider-Man and I needed to change into my costume quickly... Well, I can't see how the, 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 the usual conceit is that they wear it underneath their regular garb. So yeah. Superman, that obviously... That does going to the lavatory awkward. Yes. Um, and you'd, that's one thing that's actually, as far as I can tell, has only been... I think it might have been addressed in one of the spoof films. Um, I can't quite remember whether there was... Whether it was there or not, but it, yeah, yeah, I mean, if you Why if isn't you've the got zip at the front? yeah, quite. But if you do have a skin tight yeah. like spandex, whatever it happens to be, costume on, it is going to make life difficult, yeah, and you never see it. Um, any. There's no example of a superhero I can think of straight off the top of my head who wears a co- quote unquote costume as opposed to fancy gear, yes. who actually has an easily removable sort of lower half if you yes. like it's all they're, they're, they're bolted into them or whatever yeah yeah, absolutely you're quite right 
which uh, stooping over to do a shoelace up might be awkward as well. But uh, there we are. So there, there's an interesting. It, um, it pinches, shall we say? Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> you don't want to bend over too quickly either. No, quite. So yes, yes, yes. I have a costume to. So you have a costume. Yeah. You have a fantastic idea for um, a program. Yes, which I am very lucky. I think that I found exactly the right person in my mind to realise this for me, which was I. Obviously, as part of developing the character, actually, he came into my head unpowered. He came in as just, I want a superhero who's a bit useless. I then developed his power, and I then obviously had to work back and work out, okay, how did he get this power? Because you need to know your characters. And I've developed his backstory. And I wrote it out as a piece of prose, which came to about three and a half pages of A4. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. That's not... I haven't made this too long. I could do something with this. And I've actually had it drawn into issue number zero, which is his origin story drawn out as a comic. I.e. it's the story before the one we get to see, which is issue number one. Absolutely. And it was... I was just wandering around the internet looking at graphic designers and I came across a um, website which was, I think, supposed to be an artist's link. But I managed to find the chap on LinkedIn as well. Got his in- email address and sent him an email and said, look, I've got this project, do you fancy having a go? And he has produced this absolutely wonderful 11-page comic which I've got. So I'm now thinking of doing a 20-page programme, 11 pages of which are going to be this comic. Oh, fantastic. I'll buy two copies. <laughs> well, I'm, I, you know, I don't know whether this story is ever going to go anywhere. I've, I'm developing other characters for the universe, although the show only contains the one. But I will, I'm probably going to print a few I might use in a press pack or something. So there will be a few copies in existence that are standalone. But other than the programme, I don't suppose this will be printed again. Oh. So it's a uh, collector's okay. item. So you must come and see it. Absolutely. So, well, let us get on to the hard core business of it all, then. Where? Because you're, 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 you really are displaying your own superpowers by, I believe you're doing every day, aren't you? Of the fringe? Not quite. No, I'm not doing Sundays. Oh, I, right. I backed out of... I thought it would... It, it doing... Well, it was originally to give my cast a rest doing the military thing, but actually I think I'd need one anyway yes. doing this. Um, so I'm doing every day except Sunday. That starts on the 3rd of August, which is the Friday. Which is the very first day of the Fringe. Which is the very first day of the Fringe. And I go through to the 25th, so I'm not doing which the... Which is the very last day of your life. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, so I'm not doing the 27th, which is the last day of the Fringe. Yeah. Um, and I'm not doing any of the Sundays. But there are every other day, and it's on at 10 past 6 for the first two and a half weeks. And then on the last week, starting on the 20th, it moves to 10 past 7. Oh, right, okay. And it's 45 minutes long. And it's on at the spaces at Surgeons Hall, which I think is venue number 53, if memory serves. And the ticket prices are extraordinarily reasonable. Of course. Um, they range from 5 to £7, pounds, depending on whether you're a concession and what day of the week it is. Um, but they're all delineated on the website and on various posters and things that will be going up around the fringe. Well, David, this sounds intriguing, if, no, if nothing else, to see you um, in purple and, uh, purple and yellow, which are, are <laughs> difficult colours to pull off at the best of time, but when one's wearing them in lycra, then, well, best of Well, I wanted to go for something that looked a little bit naff, but wasn't so painful that you couldn't watch it for 45 minutes. Yes. And obviously purple and yellow, well, purple and gold would be imperial colours. Yes, of course. Um, but it, and it's not all prime. Because yeah. obviously, as soon as you go red, yellow, blue, everyone goes Superman in their head. Oh, I suppose um, so, yes. And so I wanted to try and steer away from prime colours. It, I think it works. Yes. It's a bit naff, but it, at the same time, the costume. I mean, that being the fact that it's not great superhero costume fare, but the actual costume itself will not be naff. Yeah. Being It'll made be a very by a costume, very, very though. skilled costume tailor. So but I don't want to give the wrong impression, yeah. but representing someone who's got, who's put piece something together with what he can find, and it doesn't really look that great. So. I'm looking forward to seeing it and you up there. And Likewise. of course we'll have the pleasure of uh, chatting to you and, dis- and seeing the shows that we've seen. Indeed, I look in forward Edinburgh. to it. Splendid. Musical talk. Well, that was David Kingsmill there talking to me about his, well, I was going to say lycra fetish, but we have to see if that's really going to be carried off in the streets of Edinburgh. I shall report back. But that sounds a jolly show as well. I do hope you'll get along to see that. Go along and see it at Ed Fringe if you want to book tickets. But don't forget, Edinburgh is not the only place where you can see brand new musicals. In London in September on the 7th and 8th, you can see at the Arcola Theatre in London E8 a musical called 13 Days by Alexander Bermange. It celebrates the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, If you don't know what that is, ask your parents. 
In October 1962, President Kennedy engineered a bit of a political standoff with the Soviet Union about nuclear missiles, which were based on the island of Cuba, which, of course, as we all know, is extremely close to America. And it's generally thought that those 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis really marked the point at which the human race took itself closest to being obliterated. And this musical, 13 Days, looks at the lives of three lovers, three leaders and three nations during that period. And interestingly, the score fuses Western, Eastern and Latin musical styles. And that show sounds fabulous. Do go along and see it. It's directed by Matthew Gould and the set and lighting is by Ben M. Rogers and the costumes by Jean Grey. I hope those names mean something to you, but more importantly, they're the people behind the very, very excellent Mystery of Edwin Drood revival, which we saw in the West End just recently. And that in itself seems to me a tremendously good pedigree, suggesting that this is going to be a musical well worth seeing. Go along to www.arcola theatre, and that's the French and therefore British spelling, A-R-C-O-L-A-T-H-E-A-T-R-E dot com. For details on going to see that, and it's on on the 7th and 8th of September. 13 Days by Alexander Burmange. Well, that's it for this episode of Musical Talk. I hope it's whetted your appetite for all the musical offerings that the Edinburgh Fringe has to offer. Don't forget, in a few weeks' time, you'll be hearing more from what happened up there from me and David Kingsmill, and goodness knows who else that we get to interview. But until then, I hope you enjoy Musical Talk over the summer, and I look forward to speaking to you soon. If you see me in Edinburgh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, do come up and say hello, and perhaps prove your loyalty to me by giving me money. I shan't be offended at all. Goodbye. This episode of Musical Talk was presented and produced by Thos Ribbits. Copyright Musical Talk, except for the music where the copyright remains with the creatives. Now for some musical out talks. Oh yes. Yeah, because it because it came from quite a, a kind of personal experience, I suppose. It was something we had to be. Sorry. Through the queue. Oh, I'm afraid I absolutely don't, but I suspect it might be. There's a little white jutting out building which you can see from out in the street uh, up there. But whether that's the way to get to it, I couldn't tell you. I'm afraid. Frankly, sorry. I thought he was going to recognise one. Of <coughs> oh. Well, you get that kind of. A, <laughs> I do. I don't know about that. All he wanted was directions to my food. <laughs> right. Sorry. Um, carrying on again. You were about to. Say. What was? I don't know. What was just to sell it, I guess, yeah. a bit more. Also, you know. question: When's it running? Is it the whole run? Is it the whole period? Yeah, first of the twenty seventh. Yeah, yeah, quite. Jolly good. Well done. We'll be knackered. <laughs> yeah, your fingers are have to go into cold uh, into warm water every night. I'll be all right. I did it last yeah. year. It was fine. Yeah. <laughs> it looks knackering. See you play. Oh, it's that, all right. I can do time. it. It's all right. <laughs> Because the piano is the, is the music. Yeah. The whole, all of it, you know. I mustn't get ill. That's the secret. That's <laughs> yeah, the because secret. it's all in you his to head. your hands in. Yeah. Oh, you haven't written it down? <laughs> I, I, it is written down, yes. <laughs> okay, but, okay. It will, be, it will be written down. It will be written down. Maybe yeah. available to buy. No. <laughs> yeah. Musical talk is about talking, it really is. Mm. It's, um, so it's not a structured, questioned interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be, let's see where we start. Let's have a chat about where it takes us. Um... And it could take us, Lord knows, anywhere, really. Um, (laughs) But if halfway through you suddenly discover that you've libelled everyone you've ever met, then say... that's my way. Then do say, do you mind if we don't use that? Because (laughs) I'll be glad to cut that out. As I say to everybody, this is not an expose. Mm. Um, I'm not working for Panorama. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, my name's Grant. I've travelled down here from Southgate today on the Northern Line. Went by the Piccadilly Line. It was hot. This is entertaining. <laughs> uh, and you as well, please? Uh, my name's Thomas Huron Towers. Um, uh, it's Huron because it's Spanish. Uh, my dad's Spanish. My mum's English. Met them in a club in Ibiza. Um, both couldn't speak. Sorry, you yeah. met them in a club. Not yes, you? I yeah. met them in a Yeah, and I was like, oh, do you want to be mum and dad? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, having said that was all right, I'm going to ask you both to come in just a little bit. So that's, forgive me. You work together, so you. Unless yeah, you, yeah. Unless you're Gilbert and Sullivan, you uh, <laughs> should still be talking. Yeah. Marvellous. Thank you. That's fine. So, right, okay, next question then. I'm going to ask you, and it, forgive me, it follows very closely on from that last one. One each. 
one adjective, please, to describe the tone as far as you see it. One adjective. Just so we can pitch it. I'll cut out the, uh, the gap so you both sound uh, <laughs> yeah. immediate, straight on yeah, it. immediately intelligent and sharp. You can have a different one each if you want. Yes. I'm and they put a hyphen between the two. That's, yeah, that's... So, uh, are you Tom and Grant or Grant and Tom? We, we kind of... It doesn't... I don't think that matters either way. No, I mean, we, okay. we go by Martin and Towers, I think. Yeah, I think as a writing team, so that's kind we, of how people Yeah, we've stuck on us. that one. Yeah. Well, I, I used to write with... Um, uh, only in our case, we used to write pantomimes, but uh, the, the conceit we did was on the songs, we would credit... Um, my friend's surname, then my surname, and then on the book it would be my surname. And oh, his well, we kind of did that, didn't we? like? Did we? Well, I, <laughs> no, okay. Well, without him knowing, no. On the book, on the book, I Beautiful. think my name would come first, and and then your name second, and then on the on the you know on the on the music it would be the other way around mostly. Are you both happy with that? Yeah, I think so. That's fine. Lovely.